Welcome to Grow My Business or Sell It, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs in three ways. How to grow your business in the most cost-effective way, how to sell it for as much money as possible, and how to invest the proceeds of all that hard work. Whichever stage you're at, Listen up, because I guarantee you'll take something valuable from every episode. Welcome back. My guest today is famous for building nine separate million-pound businesses in the last 12 years. He's a Sunday Times best-selling author, a serial entrepreneur, and founder of Entrepreneurs Circle, the UK's largest private organisation dedicated to helping entrepreneurs to get and keep customers. So it's not surprising that he's known as the most sought-after business growth expert in the UK. Along with his team, he's helped over 50,000 entrepreneurs to skyrocket their business success through a proven five-part system, how-to guides, tools, resources, and live weekly calls. And I need to declare an interest here, having been a member of EC myself since it was founded back in 2010. So I'm especially pleased to say welcome to the show, Nigel Bottrell. Blimey, Graham, that was a what an intro. <laughs> God, it's downhill from here, buddy, I tell you, goodness. Well, no pressure, Nigel, but I tell you what, I mean, there's a load of stuff I want to dig into, but I think for those of you who may not be familiar with your story, could you give us a kind of three-minute version of your journey from the corporate world into becoming a serial entrepreneur? Um, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll try and do it in, in, in less than three minutes, really. So um, I... Um, I had a very working class upbringing uh, in Yorkshire and where, you know, you worked hard and you got a job. None of this university nonsense for me. My mother got me my first paper round. Well, I came from school one day when I was 13. She got, I've got your job. And um, and so when uh, when I took my O-levels back in 82, um, I had even, you know, I got out of the education system, not because... You know, I, 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 I was doing well in it, but um, you got a job, you worked, and in the heart of the Thatcher recession. So I started, uh, my first job was at Barclays Bank. And uh, I actually had a fantastic time at Barclays. I was there for um, about 18 years, joined as a 16-year-old, and and um, had a lot of fun, got got to quite a senior level there, built their first call centres and stuff. And um, but, but knew I was never going to become kind of chief exec at Barclays. And, uh, and so I bailed in my mid-30s and had some fantastic experiences working with, um, first of all, John Cordwell, um, right at the time when he was you know, in his maximum time of growth with his um, Phones for You empire, which was really fascinating. Learned a lot from John. And then more lastly with a guy called Hamish Hogston, who built a business called CPP. And Hamish um, graciously um, appointed me as the managing director. Um, so I was the kind of employed MD, and he just let me get on, and that really fueled my... I needed my own train set, and so in my very late thirties, I um, <laughs> I had a meeting with Hamish. Uh, I used to go see him one day a month and uh, talk through you know the business etc. And he'd leave me alone for the rest of the month, so it was it was a great role to have. And I went down to Chelsea where he lived, where we used to meet every month. And I decided that I was going to tell him that my plan was to leave, you know, in six or seven months' time next summer. And, and the conversation didn't quite go as I'd planned. And although he was very supportive of me, it ended with me agreeing to leave in a fortnight's <laughs> time. <laughs> and so my entrepreneurial career was kind of a little bit thrust upon me, um, which again was not, not a no bad thing. And so I started my own business in, at the beginning of 2003, first working day of 2003. I, I cut out on my own. And, um, and I was, it, was both, it was terrifying, if I'm honest, because uh, at that point, you know, we, I'd built a very nice lifestyle. You know, I had a, I had a decent six-figure income. We had a nice house, you know, nice cars. And, and I didn't want to give up any of that, but I really wanted my own business. My wife had been was a full-time mum to the three young kids that we had then, all quite young at that stage. And uh, I'll never forget the very first day when uh, you know, I was, my, my business was starting and the, Sue took the children off to school. And like many businesses, it started in the back bedroom upstairs and I went upstairs. The house was completely silent. And as I walked into my office and the door kind of closed behind me, and I remember this feeling of absolute, oh, shit. Like, you know, everything that matters to me in the world is now hanging on my shoulders. It's all kind of down to me. And I started out initially, I knew marketing, I was good at building businesses, and that, that was what I knew. I thought, well, I'll find some businesses that need a bit of help, and I'll, and I'll work with them. And, um, 
I'd remortgaged my house, so I had some money to which um, to live on. Um, I did that very hurriedly because in, in the two weeks between Hamish and I agreeing my departure, I figured well, I'm still employed, I can still fill the forms in properly and without committing mortgage fraud because uh, I was still technically employed at that point. So I took took some cash out uh, on, on the on the remortgage to give me some money. And the deal I had with Sue was that my so my wife's called Sue was that um, I had a year to basically generate a hundred thousand pound of income for us because if I did that we could preserve our lifestyle and if I couldn't do that then I'd jack it in and I'd go and get another job no pressure so the, 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 <laughs> well, but, but that's but looking back that was so brilliant and I was at one level I was really blissfully ignorant because and I know yeah you know, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs now and and for quite a lot of people the notion that you could earn like a hundred thousand pounds in your first year is oh my god that's such a lot of money and this is going back nearly 20 years now because this is this was 2003 um, but that, that was the number. But I was just blissful. I, my logic was really simple. It was, well, I, I'm earning more than this working for somebody else. I have to be able to earn that working for myself. Like, how do I do it? And I think actually in many ways that, that kind of ignorance was, was quite a big strength. Um, so, uh, so I got stuck in and, and Sue was very supportive. But she was also a little bit, you know, obviously a bit nervous because, um, you know, what's going to happen here? And, and she had this little idea that she would um, set up and run a local kind of community magazine for, for, for the little, um, it's not, I call it a village, it's more of a suburb of Solihull where we live. And, and so she created this thing and um, it became quite a big success. And quite quickly, she was you know, just ran adverts from local businesses and stuff and had the, you know, did reviews of local restaurants and what was going on in the, in the, in the area and delivered it free into homes. And, um, and it was a really big success. And um, that, that was quite nice. That gave her a little bit of a cushion as she was contributing. But then we got people starting to ask, oh, could you, how, do you, how do you do this magazine? So we had this little idea. Maybe we could put a pack together that would show people how they could set up a magazine like Sue's. And if we did that, well, maybe that we might sell a few of those and it might, um, might pay for a couple of holidays a year. That would be quite a nice thing. And, um, and so we, we, we launched this and, um, and, and it became a phenomenon. It was extraordinary, really. And um, we called it My Mag. And it spawned over, over 2,000 magazines across the UK uh, over a three-year window. We just sold the pack for the price started about a couple of thousand pounds. Ended up going up to about nearly three and a half, four thousand pounds. But we generated like, it, it generated like six million quid from a back bedroom over like two years. I mean, it just it transformed everything. Um, and, um, and gave us the, I guess, the, the cash and the knowledge to, to start to pursue what I would call proper businesses. Because I, I never felt my mag was a proper business, even though it was hugely successful. I think what's interesting, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things that I really want to try and explore with you is, is this concept of business models. Because you know, if I went to a business broker and said, you know, I want to buy a million pound business, he's going to expect me to write a check for three million, I don't know, 10 million quid. Um, and then, you know, here's you starting a business from your back bedroom that generates that level of, of revenue. So, I mean, can, can you just talk, talk us through some of the, the business models that you've used to build these million pound businesses? Because hmm. I think it, people will be intrigued that you don't necessarily have to have a bottomless pit of money to build a seven figure business. Well, no, because we definitely haven't had that. Um, there, there, there are a few, th- a few things make it easy. I mean, I mean, the, the quickest we ever got a business from scratch to a million was three weeks. <laughs> Blimey. Um, and we launched the business literally on Monday the 1st, and by Monday the 21st, it had done a million pound of turnover um, from a standing start. Now, th- that, that business um, was, uh, that came a few years later, it was, it was 2012 when we did that. Uh, but what the requirement for that was, we, was what, I, as a marketer, I would call it was the list. Um, because that was really frank because actually the marketing cost to get there also by the way was negligible uh, um, it would have been measured in hundreds of pounds because I didn't even send any print out in the post we we um, for that one we recorded a video uh, which was about a 35 minute video um, that we spent a lot of time crafting and honing the message and but we basically put that video out to people that already knew us we had the list and the people that already knew us was, you know, had the relationship and were sufficiently confident and they wrote the checks that within three weeks we're back to a million quid on, the, on that particular business. And that, that was the model. And, and I've always been, I learned very early on, but it, <laughs> I say I learned very early on, I was very aware 
if I go right back to that very first day, I think in many ways my biggest strength was this acute awareness of my biggest weakness. Because I don't, my career to that point had been a corporate career at, at, at Barclays and, and in other businesses that I mentioned. And, and I knew that so much of what I'd learned and that had helped me climb the kind of greasy pole of corporate life was going to be useless, really, in, as an entrepreneur. And, and, and therefore, I'm going to have to learn some new stuff here. And I just, I do remember almost, you know, a calm down nights because there's other people have done this before you, you know, go and find out and learn from them, which to me sounded like obvious. And this was the time, this was 2003, 2004, when I started out was, <laughs> I mean, you remember it, Graham, you know, we, the, 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 the old dial up internet. Oh, yes. And stuff. You know, there was, there was no, no broadband and stuff, but, um, but there was the internet and um, I embraced the internet and you could find people that had done stuff and people were fairly primitive compared to nowadays, but, you know, people were sharing information. There was no YouTube or anything like that then. Um, but I locked on to people and I found a lot of people that were in America, um, which was uh, completely opened my eyes. Um, and I, but, but I'd started to learn from other people about how to do stuff. And this is where this whole, the importance of the list came from. Because um, that, that was um, taught to me by a guy called Bill Glazer, who I think of as my, my kind of business dad, really. And I mean, Bill ran a chain of menswear stores in Baltimore. Um, <laughs> but, but, but he taught me everything, really, about modern day kind of marketing, information marketing. Well, I, first, I think I first and, met you at uh, a Dan Kennedy, Bill Glazer conference in the States. There you, you know, go, and, yeah. And, and absolutely um, learning at the feet of the masters there. And, and oh. his transition was absolutely amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, but well, but in those days when when I mean when you and I um, you know went to those events, you know, what, 15, 16 years ago now. I mean, we were like the, <laughs> the reason we were kind of drawn to each other because we were like the only Brits in the room, weren't we? Do you remember? And that that was the that was the thing. And for me, and I used to love going to those events because they all all the Americans loved us because we were British. Yeah, didn't you? Didn't you win um, an award there one time? Yeah, I, well, I turned up and I found out there was this um, there, there was this contest. Um, to as marketer of the year, and you had to tell your story in five minutes. I thought, well, I'll do that, and and so I I told us the, the story about my mag and what we'd done, and and because the, the Yanks just absolutely lapped it up, and um, but I used to bring come out with so many things from those events. I would go four or five times a year across to the states. Uh, in fact, I sort of still do go well, regularly. I'm going to my first actually first event since the pandemic in a couple of weeks, but because. Um, I, I've learned such a lot because they were they were certainly going back to it's less the case now I think I think the the internet has kind of um, leveled the playing field quite a bit but going back as I say back 15 16 years ago um the the, the, the states were quite a few years ahead of us and and by immersing myself in that I was able to come back to the UK and be ahead of other people in the There's UK. A key, a key and, lesson there to bring out is you were willing to invest quite substantial sums in your own personal development to become a better business owner. And not, not everyone's willing to do that, are they? No, it's, it is very, very interesting. Uh, the, I mean, the, the very first event I went to was um, <laughs> I, I, I bought a book online, or, or not a, book, a set of resources online by a guy called Yannick Silver, who some people might know. And um, it, it was a whole series of sales letter templates. It's just an online product. I paid about $30 for it. And, and, and this was my first experience of someone really following up really well on their marketing. Because I used to get all these emails from Yannick Silver, and they were ever so personal and well written. And a few months after I'd bought this product, he invited me to his birthday bash. And he was put on this event with all these speakers in Orlando and Florida, and it was free to go to. And I thought, what a lovely chap. How kind of him to invite me. Um, but because I have to buy the airfare to get out there and stay in a hotel. And this was in my first first year in business when I'd remortgaged my house and had this money so every penny was important and I ummed and ahed about whether I should go to this event and um, I remember chatting to my dad who um, <laughs> and my dad was not in business at all he was a, he was a police officer and I said oh, I don't know to about this thing dad and, and he would give me some very wise words really because he said he said look it seems to me now that um, you've made the decision now you've set up this business and you've, you've made the leap and it seems to me that the two or three thousand pounds it's going to cost you to go to this conference in Orlando, you know, it seems to me it's not going to be decisive. You know, if, if it's a complete waste of time, it's not going to kill your business. But you might go there and you might learn some things or meet some people that could be decisive. And therefore, he says, I think you should go. So, so I got permission. <laughs> and that's kind of what it felt like in the, the beginning. So, um, so I did. I booked my ticket and I went. And, um, and that really was at the start of a lot of things for us, um, not least of which was going back to the we've gone off on all sorts of tangents already here but the this importance of having a list 
And so right from that very early days, you know, everything we do in all our businesses, we're very, um, we pay a lot of attention to how we can not just build the list, because actually the size of the list doesn't really matter. It's your relationship with the list that matters. And it's the extent to which people pay attention so, to so, it. So when you did this million pounds in three weeks, um, yeah. what was the offer? What was, was it like a franchise thing or a license fee? Or? Well, it's a... <laughs> There's another interesting story here, really. I'm a little bit embarrassed about this one because, because actually, um, I'll, I'll share. I will share the, the story and be, and be fully truthful with you. But in many ways, that 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 this business that was our quickest ever to a million that, that that's in dispute. It's just a fact. But it's, it actually turned into one of our my biggest failures as a business. Um, so that the, the ending was was not at all happy. But it came about because um, this guy in America um, tried to get in touch with me. And, and, and I was getting, I was very busy, you know, and all sorts going on and didn't really, didn't know this guy. And, and one day I was flying out, interestedly, to a Dan Kennedy event in Cleveland. And this guy rang my office in the UK. And um, the person that answered the phone let slip that um, I wasn't in the office, that, oh, he's actually gone to a conference in America. So this guy, a very resourceful chap, and he, he knew quite a lot about me, I still sort of wonder where he would be going. And he worked out that, well, he, I bet he's going to Cleveland to this Kennedy event. So um, he basically got a ticket that same day and got himself to Cleveland. And I turn up at this event. Uh, I've been flown in from the, from the UK. And uh, there's a letter in my reception. I check into my hotel. I stay at the event hotel. And there's this letter from this guy. I've been trying to get hold of you. I mean, I'm here in Cleveland this week. Could, you know, could we meet for breakfast? Oh, it's a bit hard not to... You know, do that. So, so, um, so I met him for breakfast, and he he had this amazing business. Um, and again, I think the detail probably doesn't matter too much, but it was a it, it was a very simple business that he'd um, taken out over the states, doing very well with it, very successful. And he said, "I think this would fly in Europe." He said, "And I just think you'd be the best person to to take it into Europe." Um, you know, are, are you interested? And inter- that this all came out because he'd first met me when I gave that talk that I mentioned a few minutes ago. You think it's almost like we're scripted. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's how he knew. All, that's how he knew of me, as it were. But this was the first time we'd met. Well, I did really like what 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 he was. T- it sounded great to me, and it was a, it was a very simple thing. The businesses, um, uh, local businesses were promoted on a little credit card size. It was a fold-out, so three or four credit cards fold out together, concertina thing, piece of print, little stickers on there, which had offers from local businesses. And the local businesses went on there for free. They didn't pay any money, but they gave a decent offer. And of course, the offers on the card were worth quite a lot of money. And then the cards were sold by charities or schools or sports clubs. So the, the, and the deal was the sports club sold the cards for 10 quid. They kept five. The person running the business in the area kept five. The shops did well because people went there to redeem their offers. Everybody wins. I thought, what a fantastic business. And, and so, and he showed me all the numbers, we did all the due diligence, and it all stacked up really well. And so that's what we, so the, the video that I wrote, and I told the whole story, how this guy pursued me, and we had all the story of all his numbers from America, what he'd all done in America, and that we're bringing it to the UK, and I'd carved the country up into territories, and um, I can have one person in each territory, which is why they got to a million in three weeks, because there was a real sense of FOMO. And that's right. And we priced it very attractively. So it wasn't particularly, it was only, it was like 1,500 quid or two grand to come in. It wasn't a big in. But we had all the, we had, we had 2,000 areas, you know, and it adds up, doesn't it? When you got, and, and then, and, the, and they had to buy the print from us, you see. That was the, so there was a back end revenue stream from it. And, and which was something else I'd learned at this point, because the biggest mistake I made with the very third, with the MyMag that we did, is that there was no back end continuing revenue. That, that was my, that was my absolute biggest mistake because that, that cost me a lot of money uh, in terms of missed income that, that could have been there. So, so but we went out, sold the areas in the UK, you know, supported properly, had a great print product, everything went really well, but um, really struggled to sell the cards. And culturally, uh, what I discovered, big difference between um, North America mm. and the UK. Mm. And, um, and whilst, I mean, people did it to varying levels of success, but no one was a roaring success in that business, which was the only time that's ever they happened. They are far more philanthropic uh, than we are. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, no question you know? at all. That's Brits that, that, don't that's like exactly to be told that truth, but that's the reality, isn't it? Yeah, that is absolutely that. Well, that that and that was the um, that that was the um, 
you know, the, 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 the conclusion there. But, um, but that, so there's a business model there. That, that was because we had a list mm. And we had and we had a really we had a great proposition because the you know the, the numbers were fantastic. The, the idea was you could you know you'd, you'd invest in this it would generate a nice ongoing income. It wouldn't make you a millionaire, but it would make you know you could generate you know five ten fifteen twenty thousand pound a year very comfortably as a little side hustle. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, if the, con- the the elements there you think about, it, you've got a great list, a relationship with the list. You've got a, a you're dividing the country into into regions, which is not dissimilar to a franchise model. No, but you've got a much yeah. more accessible entry point than a typical franchise. Um, yes, and and so that it's not, and and you know because of the FOMO and scarcity, and and I know I, I remember that video. It was very you know very well put together. Um, and, and that I'm not surprised you got those sales in. And, and I think yeah. most people watching it and looking at that model would have thought it would have worked. So it was probably mm. a surprise to them as well. No, completely. No, it was, it was, yeah. it was. Um, but let's not, can we not dwell on that? Let's move yeah, on well, to something tell, else. Well, well, what do you regard <laughs> as the biggest success? I mean, leaving aside EC that we'll come back to, but of, of all the other businesses. Well, okay, we'll come, we'll come out to EC in a minute to then. So, I mean, I mean the biggest success by, by, by Mars, I mean, I mean, everything started with my mag which was this essentially was a business business opportunity mm. piece but but i wanted um the big the big mistake with my mag that there was no people bought again they bought an area of territory and and lots of those magazines are still publishing today where you know literally they've been going for 17 18 years a lot of those magazines now uh there's i mean there are hundreds of uh children that have been you know, looked after by their mums at home rather than having to go into nursery and stuff because of my mag. There's families that have having a lifestyle that's a massive impact in truth across a lot of um, a, a lot of communities. Um, but from my perspective, a, a really I made mean, a big mistake because there was no ongoing income. So once we sold an area, there was no, no other money transfer. So really, I mean, a rubbish business model. I mean, a proper naive rookie kind of mistake. That Not we, bad to get six or seven million out of a. a, a no, 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 and everything. No, no, and I don't regret it. And, I, and I'm very, you know, um, everything as I said that we did subsequently, I can track back to my mag because my mag gave me the capital mm. to do things. And but I looked at my mag. This was the time you know, about 2004 when um, the internet was starting to become much more widely available. And I thought, well, there must be a way to take the best bits of these local magazines and put them online. And, 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 and we conceived what was really um, the, the, the country's first kind of online business directory. And we called it the best of, and it still continues to thrive today. I mean, it spawned, I mean, hundreds of competitors. And, um, and and we went out, we launched it. It launched in the summer of 2005, did the best of. And um, and I launched it as a proper franchise. And so, you know, with a franchise agreement and proper territories and a five-year term and a contract, I was doing it all properly. And, um, but although again, even, even at that early stage, because I had a lot of people that bought my mag, so we launched it initially to all the people that got my mag. So this is a great bolt on to your magazine business. Um, you could become the franchisee for the best of, and it brings you into the 21st century, as it were. And, and so what it, the, the end result of that was on day one, when we launched the business, we had 47 franchisees. <laughs> and, and, and this was important because I was very keen to do everything properly. So I applied to join the BFA, the British Franchise Association. And, and I, I applied whilst we were in the development phase and launched this business. And they wrote back and said, I'm sorry, you can't apply until you've actually launched the franchise. I thought, that's okay. So at day one, we launched 47 franchisees. So day two, I applied to the British Franchise Association. So when did you launch? Yesterday. How many, how many franchisees have you got? 47. And, 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 and they just didn't know what to, how to respond to this because they, they, they thought, there's, they rang me up first of all, so there's a mistake on your application. It says that you started on the 1st of July. So that's right. And it says you've got 47 franchisees. I said, well, that's right. So well, that can't be right. I said, well, it is right. I said, and I said, if you go online, you can see them all because it's an online business that's manifested here. And they did not know what to, this, this just hit every kind of possible red flag that, that had never happened in their world before. You know, to get no one, to, take, to get to 47 franchisees takes five years, whatever. You know, you, this was all contrary to everything that they knew. And, um, but I mean, the, the um, and they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't reject me because there were no grounds to reject me, but they, they wouldn't let me in um, until month 13. So it took 13 months for the BFA to uh, write to me and say that um, we accept your entry and, and now please send us £5,000, whatever the membership fee was, because they're just an organisation like everything else. And at that point, I, I, I did take great delight in, 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 um, 
in withdrawing my application because by month 13 I had over 200 franchises. You just didn't need them. And I didn't need I didn't I didn't need them anymore. Um, and so I always had a slightly a slightly edgy relationship with the BFA because of, because of that because they they just thought there must be something wrong here. Um, and and there wasn't and the best stuff continues to thrive and flourish. And and that was that that was you know we now there was a lot of investment in in the best of. But even here there's an interesting route because um, we built the, the, the best of back then, especially, although it's still true today to, to a large extent. Um, the, the best of is quite dependent on its website, and our website is quite a complex website. Again, by modern standards, less so, but back in 2005, it was a very complex website, a massive site, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages. And, um, uh, and I'd spec this out about what I wanted to build, and I went to a local guy to build it, the guy that I knew, and, and, I, and this guy said, Here's what I want to do. And he said, that's a lot of work, and this is a lot of work. So I understand that. I said, uh, what I'll do is, um, I don't want to pay you any money to build it. I said, but I will pay you a £1,000 from every franchise fee that we get over the next five years. And 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 so the guy said, oh, can you put that in, a, in, an, in an agreement? So again, I, I just wrote him a letter. That's, so that's what we're going to do. And he, it's quite interesting, because he, uh, he went to a lawyer. And, and because his lawyer told him, oh, I wouldn't trust this for the barge pole if I were you. And he came back and he said, no, no, I, I can't do this. I, I, I need you to pay me £40,000 to build this website. And I said, well, I, I'm, I, I actually had the money because it had come from my mouth, but I didn't want to do that. I said, no, no, I want someone that's committed on this with me and, and, and in there. I said, if you won't take the deal, I'll go find someone else that will. And he said, I'm not going to take the deal. So I shook his hand and I walked away. And I found, uh, I got introduced to a young guy, only 20 years old he was at the time, a chap called Dave Carruthers, who is flourishing now in, in, in the US, interestingly. And, um, and, and Dave, was, Dave was great. And I, he, he and I agreed, to, we met for the first time at a coffee shop in, in Henley. And um, I said, oh, I need to build this site. And they said, I want you to build it this way. And can you do it? And I didn't know at the time, because he said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he had no idea. <laughs> and he found out subsequently. He had no idea I was going to do it. But he took the deal and he did a fantastic job and Dave put his heart and soul into the creation of the best of and he, he did a really, really brilliant job with the, the first um, fate, the first iteration of our website. And, and over the following two years, it, I, I paid him over a quarter of a million pounds yeah. and, and that changed his life, you know, it absolutely set him off. But it also enabled me, you know, we were cause, and he was, he was properly vested in the business, he was committed to it and, you know, I was very, you know, I don't have any regrets about oh you could have got that site for 60 or 70 again, you see a paid great lesson there no. from both perspectives for you yeah. you get a major part of the business launch done at no initial cost for him yeah, exactly. he signs up to somebody who by that stage that's face had some kind of track record so he yeah. wasn't just taking a complete punt um yeah. and also he's got the bottle the cojones to actually say yes not knowing exactly how he's going to deliver it so there's a lot of entrepreneurial lessons in there no, completely. I mean, I think it was probably helpful that, I mean, Dave didn't have a lot to lose because he, he didn't have a lot. He was at a very start point of his business, but it, it worked out really very well for him. But it helped me to fund that and get that moving. And and, and, and so that really, um, and I, I had my first problem then, Graham, this might be quite interesting. So, because at that point, until we are absolutely, I mean, I, we are rolling in. So I'm, I'm only like two years into this business. I've got more, I cannot believe there's all this money flying around everywhere. And And our fourth child was born in the, summer of 06 and and sue and i've always liked to travel and travel's always been our thing but in she he was born in in july 06 was was fabian and and so we couldn't really go abroad that summer it was in the early summer we we got through the children at that point as well we couldn't go away early summer because he was heavily pregnant and once he was born it was too so that summer we went to send the uk not a problem so we went down to cornwall and um for a couple of weeks uh, in August, so Fabian's only about a month old. And um, but while we're down, we, you know, we both got very happy memories of Cornwall when, when we were kids. And I thought, what, what, Fabian's have a place down in Cornwall. And so what, what used to happen is um, for an hour every day, because that's the kind of super dad that I am, for an hour every day, I would take all four of my young children and, and give Sue an hour to herself. And I used to chuck him in the car and we'd go do something. And and, and, and this one particular night, I just drove up the coast and so, so I'm going to Travaux. And I was, Frank, and there's this beach, fabulous beach. And on the beach, there's this house. And it's got a for sale sign outside it. And I thought, oh, that looks lovely, that house. So um, no, no Wi-Fi signal or anything in those back then. And uh, went back, did some digging in the hotel room, found the place and arranged to go and see it the following day. 
And um, long story, but like bought it that afternoon, this house. It was a beautiful property. And um, and just, just wrote a check. I mean, it just felt fantastic because it, it was a big house. And uh, just, just wrote this check and, and just felt brilliant. And um, got some builders in to do, do a few amendments to it and so furnished it all out. And so we got, and this became our holiday home. We weren't going to rent it out at all. We were just going to go and spend time down there. And um, it was, all was fantastic. Until about six months later, and um, my, my accountant came um, to, 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 to my house one afternoon, and um, cause, <laughs> and, um, and so he sat through, and you know, it's been a good year. I said, yeah, we've done all right, you know, and he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, then, he said, this is, I've uh, worked it all through, he said, and um, this, is the, this is your tax bill that's got to be paid by, by next Friday. <laughs> And it was like it was like over a million. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Fuck!" Oh, I said, "I can't pay that." I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "What oh, house in Cornwall?" I spent the money. <laughs> I have. That's what I've done. So, and I was again. I mean, just ridiculously naive looking back. Again, I'm a bit embarrassed for it. I'm probably being far too open on this bloody chat, Graham. But. Um, but I, you know that, that 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 was a bit of a panic, was that really? So um, quick remortgage jobby, was it? Or? Well, well, that that was how I got out in the short term, yeah, which was actually relatively straightforward and stuff, and and, and work it all through. But um, uh, how did I get on to uh, this? I, I, well, I, 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 I tell you what probably happened. Though, apart from anything else, you get so tied up in the the business and the growth of it, and 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 you know, unless you've got, uh, and this is something I find a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, unless you've got a really proactive accountant, or maybe you can afford a CFO, you know, you're not on top of some. Of that stuff and you can get yeah. sideswiped by it well it's interesting because the um another little inside side here which might be so when when i started out uh, which was i said beginning of 2003 and i'd remortgaged the house and and i'd gone and got this accountant because he'd been recommended to me by a, a friend it's how everyone kind of gets their accountant in the beginning and and that I'd had a meeting with him before Christmas, and on New Year's Eve we were out at a party at a local kind of pub, a gastro pub near us. And on New Year's Eve, and it was about half past ten in the evening, and um, I was at the bar, and I didn't know this, but my accountant comes up alongside me. So he said, "He so he said, you're having a good night while you've still got some money, have you?" Ouch! Oh, you <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And because um, he knew about the, the, the kind of remortgage and stuff. And actually, I, I, so from that moment, I, I was, it, it actually worked as a very, um, a very motivating factor for me. Because actually, I'm going to show, I'll show you. Um, but I did take quite a lot of pleasure, you know, within a few weeks of that, the, the later incident happening with the, that, that, that very large tax bill of, of kind of upgrading my accountant. And I, 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 you're absolutely right there, by the way. I, and I'm a really strong advocate that most people in business don't pay their accountant enough money. And that's actually what it comes down to. And that, that's the accountant's fault, by the way. It's not the client's fault. Um, but so many accountants, they don't charge enough money to be able to be proactive and to give enough time to their clients. Yeah. And therefore, you, they, they give a mediocre service or sometimes a very poor service. Um, they do the minimum necessary. Necessary. And, and, and especially when you're at the helm of a growing business, I've always found, you know, and I've, I've, I've had a number of very, very good accountants over the years since, and, and they've played a very, very important part in, in, in all our, you know, development and expansion and, and a lot of the things. that. Uh, so something else that's played an important part for you, I think, um, uh, is, is events. And, and I think um, mm. live events. And, and I think for me, I've, I've always found that getting bums on seats to live events is one of the toughest things of all. But you've had this strategy, I I think I was probably at the first or the second DC event. It was a clubhouse of a golf course near Solihull. I think it was about 50 of us. And these days yeah. you get like 1,200 yes. people to your event. So, so what's mm. been your kind of event strategy and how's it evolved over the years? Well, I think the, um, I mean, the first thing to recognise is, I, you know, and we obviously, we do do a lot of stuff online nowadays and uh, that is very helpful to people and we've, I've invested, we've got a full broadcast studio in our building here and we, you know, we, we so we do, we've embraced the, the kind of uh, all the things that you're able to do now um, through the internet. But, and it's a really important but, um, it's never the same as actually being in a room and having made a journey and gone there and, and worked through. And so we continue to have programs of face-to-face events. And we, we run big ones 
um, four times a year. One, one in particular, our big convention is the one where we, you know, we, we do get. In fact, we're recording this in the first week of June, and we've we're about to sell out. We're, we're by, I expect in the next couple of days we'll have sold all the tickets to over twelve hundred mm-hmm. tickets because we've taken the ICC in Birmingham, and that's not till September. So we're fully sold out three months in advance, um, which is it, I'm really pleased. I wonder about. if part of that's Although, a sort of post-pandemic bounce that people are desperate to get out and meet each other again, especially in entrepreneurs well, who you know it's a lonely old life sometimes. Sometimes. There's definitely some of that because I mean we, we also run local events. I think as you know, every, every month in in a hundred different towns and cities around the country, there is an EC local event run run by for our members by our members, effectively. And, and you know, and, and many of those are thriving as well. And def- definitely the I think the, the kind of fears that w- that were there in the pandemic have definitely dissipated a lot during the first half of of, of this year. Um, the, the reason why we've sold out, I think, there's a, a little bit more to it because. We, we we did work really hard because we ran the event for the first time since COVID last September, and we did work really hard for the big convention um, at, at, at encouraging as many people as possible that were at last year's event to buy their ticket for this year's event, and and that helped us hugely because the, the reality of it is is that three quarters of the tickets for this year's event were sold at last year's events, so we made a very strong offer. Um, on the second day if you've enjoyed it this year we're going to come back and do it even better next year here's the lowest price that bet you could pay in installments over 10 months you know but you this offer is only valid until five o'clock today um and as it happens i say three quarters of the room um you know bought bought their tickets and that that did make life a lot easier for us and we we, we threw all sorts there was quite a lot we did to to, to, to make that so, very so I mean EEC is a kind of monthly membership model so do, do you see these yes. events as primarily a, a kind of a, a membership loyalty driver or do you see them as a, as a more of a you know how to get new members into the entrepreneur circle well I, I, well I think my, my, our view has changed over time if I'm honest with you so we've the only event that is the, the, the local events that I mentioned are an integral part of membership so there's no price to pay or beyond your membership and standard EC membership is £99 a month which is a really good price point from a lots of perspectives. And and if it was cheaper, yeah, there's a few more people to join us. I've no doubt about that at all. Uh, there are smaller businesses for whom £99 a month is a prohibitive sum, but um, we are not we don't bring the price below that because at £99 a month, we've got money to spend to do the things that make EC special and valuable and useful. And you know, we send a, a printed magazine. It's really, you know, we're really proud of that every single month in the post. And I could, I could save £12,000 a month by sending it digitally but I'd, I'd, it would be just like that would be a ridiculously stupid thing to do because the physicality of the magazine how the, the 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 live events help not everybody comes to, to the events but that we do try and make the convention which is our big one and that's that's not part of membership so the only way you can get to the convention is you have to buy a ticket and um and and so and m- i'm gonna pretend most of the people that come are members of ec not everybody but most are members of ec so in the beginning when we come conceived the, the convention we did see it as a recruitment tool but in practical terms it, it, it isn't really not 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 in not to any magnitude it's um, it is where the ec kind of comes together almost that's the that's the one event that kind of i say everybody it isn't we're way bigger than 1200 members but but it, you know but lots of people come and they meet people that they meet once a year at the yeah, convention yeah, you have the awards night as well as so you recognize members and so which is always a powerful right, yeah, thing yeah. to do as well isn't it so no, I think I think so. so I mean, uh, clearly, events have a, an important part for any kind of community-based business where you're wanting to uh, keep that loyalty. You're wanting to extend the, the 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 lifespan of their membership because obviously that 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 sort of lifetime value is key to you as well, isn't it? Yeah, and you and you, but you have this as well with your business because it's not it's not just about that, but it also it pulls people closer to you. Uh, you know, because you do at the end of the day, whilst you know, in, in, even in two dimension on a computer screen, we you know we can get to know each other a lot better. Videos great, but it's not the same as actually being kind of you know in in, in the room and pressing the flesh. And um, any any business where you know, and obviously, it's not, this doesn't apply if you. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've got a, tra- you know, a, a chain of electrical contractors, it, this doesn't apply. But any businesses like yours or mine, I think the, the, the bringing people together is a really smart thing to do and finding the best way to do it. We're launching something, um, I probably shouldn't tell you this really, um, but we're going to launch something at the convention um, 
in, in this year in September, we're going to launch the EC Travel Club, um, which is taking events to another level, really, mm. because um, there'll be there'll be three trips next year, um, all with all with a bit of purpose. Mm. Mm. But and now we're not looking we're not doing that as a money maker no. uh, at all. Um, I don't want it to cost me a great deal, so it, it'll wash its face as the plan. But we'll do it because it'll make us an even more significant part of the lives of the members that become oh, that's come on great, the trips. Yeah. So that's, that's all from the same okay. the same kind of place. And this is in terms of business models, you know, the the, the entrepreneur circle in many ways is the kind of culmination of, of and, and EC is twelve years old now. We, we launched in twenty ten. Mm. But um, and it's by far the biggest part of our business now. Um, you know, we've got we've got you know thousands of members. Yeah. And um, but what it has is the it's the, the, the recurring revenue stream, and when you talk about grow and sell a business, uh, you know for me, this was the thing that we we did lock onto quite not quite early on was just how much better life is when you have a recurring revenue stream. Yeah, I agree, but I think both of us uh, you know, share those things in common. But the other side of the coin, I've found, if we talk about the sell part of all this. Um, mm. When you build a business where you and your personality and everything and your brand is at the core of it, it's brilliant for building what you might call a lifestyle business, but it's not so strong for building a sort of an equity that you could sell to a third party because, you know, the, the Joe Bloggs entrepreneur circle just might not work, yeah. you know? So, I mean, yeah. how has that influenced your thoughts on potential exit strategies? Well, um <laughs> Okay, this is this is this is where I probably will, will differ a little bit from you. I'm very I'm very very fortunate, Graham, because I have I have a, a team around me here, and there's there's, there's nearly forty in the team here, uh, that that energise and inspire me every day. I've got a customer base that I love and think the world of, and and every day is like a holiday. Really, I love coming to work. Why on earth would I want to exit this business? Honestly, I genuinely it, it provides everything that me and my family could possibly want. Uh, and I'm having far too much fun, and and I do recognise the truth in what you said. Just to be clear, I, I completely recognise that you know the entrepreneur circle is you know is I'm trying to we're trying to we are doing things to remove dependency, but I do recognise whilst ever I've, I'm I'm kind of here and breathing, you know I'm going to be part of the fabric of it, and but I, that doesn't stress or trouble me at all. Um, you know I I take I, I don't um, I only do things in the business now. That I enjoy and I'm best yeah, at. Yeah, indeed. So indeed. producing the content is is really my thing, as it were. That that's where you know. And, and uh, but operationally, everything. I don't. I don't. I mean, I, if I had to pick the one skill that's probably served you best of all, I'd be interested to see whether you agree or not. I would think it's probably copywriting. I think you, you, you've always been a well, master of it, and but I think obviously that's had to adapt as we've gone into video and everything else. But w- would you say that's it's, a- ca- it's kind of you to say so? Yeah. I, well, in, interestingly, um, I, I mean, we I, I work hard. We, we uh, to, and I do still write all the copy that 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 that, um, that we utilise. But I, I think um, what when we when we talk when we sit down with my, my leadership team and we look we talk about the business, the the conclusion we came to is that you know, the bit that I bring that is is unique is, is my ability to communicate and I'm a very good communicator and I can whether it's on camera or on stage you know I can communicate a message and I can engage people and I can inspire them and I can you know and, and, and that so therefore what we try and do is put me in situations where you know I do as much of that as possible and and if it's not that then I don't do it and that's that's where we've got to and that leads me to the situation that I described where actually well I'm doing the stuff that I enjoy and that I'm yeah. good at and that and, and and I don't want to exit that and you know um you know hopefully uh, you know I, I have no intention of um exiting an entrepreneur circle you know for a, for a very very long time now, interesting because every week you send a, an email to club members usually it's kind of mm. motivational new week let's get going let's get you know get into it sort of thing but the last mm. year you sent an email out and the subject line was 18 more summers and that really resonated because mm. i'm a decade ahead of you so if i'd written it it would have said mm. eight more summers and that was because yeah, yeah, yeah. we just yeah. lost the the rock star meatloaf meatloaf and he obviously meant a lot to you and sue and everything mm. so i just wonder whether you know that sort of you know coming face to face with mortality had had any kind of impact on how you live your life how, how, how you get the life work life balance and so on right Ah well, well, okay. This this is really interesting, and that that was yeah, because the, the, the eighteen summers came because when Meat Love died, he was eighteen years older than I was at that point. So I thought, well, I've got if I live to that age, I've got eighteen more summers. But um, 
Uh, well, you, you touch on something here, which I think is, I've never really gone into great depth on this. And I'm sure kind of psychologists that know far more would have a field day with this. And I don't know whether you're aware of, of, of this, but I, I left school at 16, as I mentioned earlier, after my O levels. But most of my year stayed on into sixth form. And at the time, I, I was at a, an all boys comprehensive school in, in Leeds. And um, when I left school in, in the two years of sixth form, there were, there were 120 boys in my year at school. And by the time that year had finished sixth form, 26 of them had died. Yikes. And I, I, I used to meet my friends because I'd left school. I, I, was, I was at work at Barclays and I used to meet all my mates at funerals. And, and I mean, it was a, a, an extraordinary sort of sequence of things that happened. But, um, but what it did, uh, certainly for me, looking back, it brought me to terms with my own mortality, actually at a very young age. Uh, way younger than I think it happens to most people because I've been aware since I was 17 or 18 years old that actually I'm going to die and and, and, and actually it could be quite soon because look what's happened mm. and even thinking back now and I'm looking it's amazing now you know the thinking how you know I've had kind of nearly 40 years more than um, than some of my pals and I do think that's been a factor that stayed with me. I don't have any, tr- I very much, and I mean, and, and I think I was fortunate to meet Sue because, she, you know, she, she's definitely kind of fueled this a little bit because we've always been uh, people that have very much lived for now. Um, and, and let's do things because none of us, none of us know how long we're going to be here, you know, and, and happiness this year and this week and this month is you know is something that you know I, I will pursue and progress and i'll try and be sensible because hopefully there will be a future so you know i will try and prepare for that i won't be completely cavalier but equally if there's you know if there's if there's somewhere to go or there's a trip to go and i look at it you know, I, I i i do i, I love um, football is my thing you know so you know i've been to i've just watched football all over the world all the world cups and everything and you know and it's lovely to be able to write the check and just go. That's one of the big liberating things for me. I haven't, I haven't been. I'm enjoying my golf again now. Playing a lot of golf. Yeah, but you need and, to come uh, here. There's been... twelve golf courses within well, five yeah. minutes of where I live. <laughs> well, <laughs> interestingly, Graham, the, you know, the, the EC Travel Club may be coming to Portugal <laughs> to play golf next year. I mean, the um, yeah, but, but those things. But I want to do things like that, and and that's about. And, and, and I want to drive the business and make the most of today because. And I think a lot of that does come. From what was a very, you know, I mean, I mean, I think, to, well, I know that, um, you know, statistically, you had more chance of surviving the D-Day landings in 1944 than getting through the sixth form at Templemore School in 1982, which is, is just extraordinary. Absolutely. Now, unfortunately, the clock is against us, as it's so often now. You know, he, oh here's the God. scenario. I, I've kidnapped your, your wife and children. I've, I've held a gun to your head. And the only way they get released and, and, and you get out of here alive is that you share with us the three biggest lessons you've learned in building successful businesses in your career. So you have three oh, minutes goodness. starting now. Uh, oh, God, that's hard, is that? Um, so, um, well, I, I think I've met, we've mentioned one of them, re- recurring revenue. Um, you know, for me, businesses, when, you know, not having to start the month on zero it didn't half make life easy, you know, easier, sorry. Um, cause I can, so I, that, that for me is a, it's certainly a really important criteria for any, any business that we pursue is can we develop the recurring income? So, multi, you know, multiple sales. Um, that, that's been a really, a really big deal for us. Um, the um, business is a lot easier when you've got relationships with people that have both a willingness and an ability to spend money with you. And, and that's back to the list, which we also talked about. So you know, we do spend a lot, and we spend money as well as time, finding ways to nurture that list. And that, that's, a, I think that's the other. So, so nurturing the list and the relationships, recurring revenue is, is really important. Just, be, <laughs> just rephrase the question for me again, so I've got this absolutely bang yeah, on for you. The three most important that's... lessons you've learned in business, in building successful Well, that, okay, so there, so there we go. So recurring revenue relationship with the list and having fun because life's too short and I don't understand why anybody that runs their own business would do something that doesn't excite them at the end of the day because you know if it doesn't excite you get rid of it and do something else that absolutely does. brilliant well I'm, I'm sure you've got a lot more than 18 summers ahead Nigel so enjoy them all keep doing the important work you're doing with Britain's entrepreneurs and thanks very much for sharing with us today great to talk to you Graham thanks for having me 
If you'd like to suggest topics for future episodes, appear as a guest on the show, or invite me onto your podcast, you can get me on graham at grahamrowan.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on Grow My Business or Sell It.